I, we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jermaine Davis. I'm the moderator for today, our Next Generation Black and Biophysics panel. Um, I'm excited to participate in this and see um, just how broad and amazing uh, biophysics is. And also to meet new um, and, and, and established scientists across the biophysics realm. And also to interact with uh, the general public. Um, as you will, as, as each presenter will demonstrate, um, we all love our field and uh, there are various aspects of biophysics that fascinate us. Um, and, and we're really interested in sharing some of the work that we do and potential in the field of biophysics with you. So today um, we have a panel of uh, five researchers, um, as you see demonstrated here. And what I would do first is to introduce kind of what is biophysics um, in, a, in a general sense. And so biophysics is um, a really interdisciplinary uh, research field, and it, it combines many different areas to apply theories and methods of physics to understand how biological systems work. So um, if you're not familiar with that um, in, in the terminology itself, you're probably familiar with it in some everyday activity or everyday observations. And so one of the things that I thought I would do was, was to provide an example of uh, types of questions biophysicists um, can address. Um, and so what you see here are bacteria in this image that are moving. And so you see the different magnification of the bacteria and you see them moving at different rates and in different capacities. And one of the questions in the fields have been, um, how exactly do bacteria move? Um, and we know they move by, um, some have this filament which propels them to move throughout different media and, 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 and different um, settings. So one of the questions that, um, uh, biophysics can tend, uh, attempt to answer is, oh, how do bacteria swim? So this is kind of a fundamental question um, that applies many rules of biophysics. And so I thought I would share something that I found pretty fascinating that's been a, a recent development in the field. And so um, we know that bacteria has this flagellum and it has this motor or this, this, this motor region that propels this flagella. And so one of the questions is, how does that actually work? And so using structural biology, a group recently found, determined the structure of this large motor complex. And this has been a pretty fascinating uh, development in, in the field of biophysics, as well as in structural biology. Um, and what you're seeing here is how we can use computer simulations to actually move and understand the dynamics of this motor. So as I mentioned, um, biophysics is a, an interdisciplinary um, uh, field. And so math, physics, uh, biology, chemistry are all integrated into this to really understand systems at a fundamental level. And biophysics is helping to transform our understanding of basic biology and the practice of medicine in so many different ways. And I would just like to give credit to Brady Johnson who created this, this movie image that um, is really, I find fascinating. Um, and so what, what you're about to, um, and so now we turn it over to the panelists and you'll, you'll, you'll hear um, pretty vast, diff uh, pretty different um, uh, research areas from our panelists. And they can tell you, um, uh, introduce themselves um, and how they got into the field of biophysics. So Juliet, you have the floor. Okay, so did you want to do a general introduction or should we go ahead and just start the five minute presentation? Yeah, you could, uh, uh, sorry, you can all introduce yourself, have a few minutes and, and maybe discuss um, why you chose biophysics or how you got into biophysics. Um, and, then, um, and then you can start with your presentation. Okay, actually it's part of my presentation. So I'll just share it right away. <laughs> Uh, just gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
All right, so um, hi everyone. It's very, very um, nice to be here. And my name is Juliet um, Obi, and I, well, I am a second year um, Doctor of Philosophy PhD student. And to answer um, how or how I got into biophysics is that I didn't start from biophysics in the beginning. I am actually uh, a pharmacist by training and I so a pharmacist is a medication expert and so I worked for almost two years as a pharmacist in my home country and then I decided to well while, while I was in pharmacy school I always had um, a passion for research and development so I knew that I was going to pursue further studies and kind of like change my career into uh, something in research and development so I became more interested in biophysics uh, because I got my master's in pharmaceutical sciences and I my master's was focused on structural biology like Jamin mentioned so for my PhD I actually became more interested in that field which is why I'm doing something in that area so that's who I am and I'm currently getting my PhD at the University of Maryland Baltimore all right so I'm just going to introduce what my lab does and just to kind of get you into um, a little bit of what we do and to hopefully facet or like um, get you motivated to maybe consider uh, a career in biophysics. So this is my lab. Um, my supervisor is pretty much uh, a new supervisor. He just started his lab last year. So we're about like a year in and we're currently four of us in the lab, as you can see. Um, so our lab uh, focuses on using a combination of experimental um, biophysics uh, methods, which we refer to as the wet lab, and computational methods to uh, understand how biomolecules that are called proteins. So pro proteins are biomolecules in our body that do a lot of functions that is needed for our everyday uh, life. So we try to understand how biomolecules uh, called proteins work. So we look at their structure and their function, and we use the combination of these uh, wet lab and computational methods to uh, study that. Another thing we do is to understand how proteins fold. So one of the things that Jermaine mentioned is, uh, one of the things we do in the field of biophysics is to understand or use that physics um, to understand biological mechanisms. So one of the things we're very interested in is to understand how proteins fold because protein folding is important to how a protein functions in the cell. So right away, I don't have a lot of time. I made a video to kind of just show you one of the things that we do. And one of the proteins that we study in our lab is called alpha-1 antitrypsin. And this protein is very important for ensuring that we don't get diseases like lung diseases and liver diseases. So straight up, I'm just going to play the video. Uh, can you guys hear the audio in the video? We should be able to when you play. Okay, perfect. Maybe click again, is it playing? Can you hear anything? No. Okay. Well, let me see. Uh, let me Maybe play again because it's not moving. Or oh, it will be model. There Can you hear anything now? Yes. Okay, perfect. By starting I'm going to start it all over again. Oldest... To... So, in our lab, like I mentioned, we do use um computational methods and one of the computational methods we use is um, called molecular dynamic simulations where we get to um, simulate or we model how some proteins fold by starting from their unfolded state to their folded state and um, proteins have um, three-dimensional shapes like the one I'm showing right now and they need to fold in our bodies they need to fold to their correct three-dimensional shape to function properly now this protein I'm going to show you is an example of one of the proteins that we study in our lab 
and it's called alpha-1 antitrypsin, A180. It's a very important protein in our body because it protects our lungs from inflammation and it protects our lungs from irritants that we inhale from the environment like tobacco smoke. The way this protein folds is very important for its function. So any misfolding can lead to diseases like lung and liver disease. So I'm just going to show you a video of um, a simulation or a model where we started from um, the unfolded state of this protein. And when it's unfolded, you're going to see everything fall apart and then it's going to start coming back together. As you see, the protein is falling apart and we are modeling how it starts from the unfolded state to the folded state. As you see, the protein is coming together and some parts of it are folding in its correct state, as you see. And what we want to understand from here is what is the path of folding? Which section of the protein gets to fold first? And which section of the protein gets to fold last? So if you notice, this particular section is actually going to fold last. And the way it also folds is something that we are trying to study. For example, this part has to insert itself itself into this section or this region of the protein. After a few seconds, you're going to see that this region is going to slowly go back. As you see, it has inserted itself and then this part actually folds or comes together last. Um, Actually, this particular part can actually fold, but then we don't see that. So this is just an example to show you how we uh, work in our lab and how we use computational methods and how we use these methods to understand how some proteins fold and the pathway to their folding. All right, so um, I hope that I was able to explain a little bit of what we do in the lab. And that's all for me. And um, Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, are there any questions? Please put them in a the chat box. Um, how long did it take to to get that to work, Juliet? Okay, so it takes a couple of tries and um, depending on the computational power we have, that's something that, you know, computational biologists have to consider and the time scale of performing the simulation. So for this particular simulation, it was done at a um, 100 nanoseconds time scale. And sometimes that can take anything from three days to a week. It also depends on how huge your protein is. This protein is not too big, so it kind of took like about a week. But um, a particular protein, like the one I particularly study, it takes anything like two weeks to uh, a month, you know, um, depending on the computational power we have. So yeah, it's easy to just show one minute video, but it actually takes longer to produce that. Right, and so in your training as a pharmacist, are you looking to develop a drug for that? Or are there any known drugs that bind to, um, to inhibit or prevent it from um, uh, causing disease? Uh, right now, no. And, uh, you know, um, the folding of this protein, or this protein is known to be misfolded a lot. And there is actually a deficiency that people have, they call it A1 AT deficiency where people that have that deficiency are exposed to like some diseases. So right now, no, um, which is something my lab is trying to study. But this particularly is not my major project. But yes, the main goal is to kind of understand this particular protein and maybe we can target a section or a part of it that can be used for drug purposes. Okay, great. So we have a question from Alejandro. What type of math do you use daily? Sorry, what type of math? What type of math 
mathematics do you use daily is involved in in that simulation or or in your in your field um there is a lot of biophysics so i wouldn't say physics in isolation <laughs> there's a lot of um uh you know uh i would say differential math uh calculus all of these things are uh physics it's it's really physics honestly um that is needed but it's not like we have to actually calculate these things. These things are, um, there's something called force fields that are very uh, much, uh, you know, it's more statistical mechanics that people already or scientists have come up with or have developed. So we use these force fields to run these particular simulations and they come in form of packages and softwares that we use. So essentially you just need to know the mathematical concepts to pursue yes. this. Yes, you definitely you don't have to derive formulas on the board like <laughs> No, I, I cannot even for the life of me. But yes, there are packages and there are scientists that work very hard to actually develop these packages that we use in the lab. So if you if you have a basic if you have a pretty good grasp on the mathematical the differential equations, you'll be able to understand the force fields and the dynamics involved to simulate that. Yes, and uh, something I forgot to mention, there's also a lot of coding uh, uh, that is, you know, so it's coding is not my thing, but I have a colleague who um, in my lab, he he's, his project is exclusively trying to um, come up with scripts that can make it easier for us to run these simulations where you can just write a script and then it just runs it for just, you instead of actually just just hit execute and have it run exactly so that's like what he's he's trying to do so so coding is another you know we hear a lot about coding um in in everyday society now and and that's definitely um an area that can also that's obviously also incorporated into biophysics so yes so coding is definitely something um that would be helpful um, and as we learn, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there's a lot of other areas that that can be. The more advancements we have in other areas, the more we can advance in biophysics. So that's great. So, John, do you have a question? I I have two questions for Yuli. And the first one is, um, what kind of simulation program do you use? Use Anton computer or which one do you use? And the second one would be, um. Is there is any mutation that could actually affect the folding part of the protein? And is you are willing to study those things to understand what are the regions that are concerned and important in order for the protein to fold? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, we use, um, so there are force fields we use and we have packages that actually carry out or execute the simulation. In our lab, we mostly use charm force fields to, uh, you know, for the first field, and then we use OpenMM for the actual simulation. So um, that's what we use, but we're also trying to use Amber as well. Um, yes, that's what we use. Um, and then for the mutations, yes, there are certain residues um, that we know, you know, when mutated uh, can actually result in this misfolding. And that's also something one of my colleagues is um, that's what he's particularly looking at, where he can actually simulate the mutant. So we can do uh, mutation uh, molecular dynamics and actually see how that can be compared to the um, wild type of the protein. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Juliet. That was very informative. So next up, we have Bobby Brown, who's also a graduate student. Okay, and she'll introduce herself and and her talk. All right, fantastic. Okay. Uh, Are you able to there we go. Okay. So uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, so one of the things I'll just say just before you start is um, the attendees, you know, each of us panelists have our own fields, but we're also fascinated by the work done in other fields. So every time we present, we discuss what we understand about biophysics and how it applies to medicine. So as John asked a question about variants, we hear a lot about genetic variants be because of genetic sequencing. And when, we, when those genetic variants arise in patients or people, 
um, one of the key things we want to understand is how does it function? How does it function differently from the, the, the normal one or the wall type? And so this is a really kind of um, powerful method to really kind of rapidly assess how genetic variants may impart function. So thanks for that question, John. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bobby Brown. I am uh, currently a PhD student in neuroscience at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, I'm doing my PhD work um, in the Giro lab in the anesthesiology department. And today I just wanted to share a little bit about me and just share with you guys my journey of um, how I got into neuroscience. So um, just starting off a little bit about me. I, uh, here's a, just a picture of my family when we were all together down in Little Rock. And um, this is Little Rock, Arkansas, the city. It's a, it's a pretty small city, but it's uh, really beautiful along a uh, riverfront here. Um, and I guess just growing up in Little Rock, I, I found this picture by um, a book called I Love My Hair by Natasha Tarpley. And I thought it, it um, pretty much fit my childhood because I was always curious, um, always wanting to know how things work, take things apart in my house and asking my dad a thousand questions about you know, anything I could think of. Um, so as I progressed through, you know, elementary, middle, middle and high school, I really took a liking to um, psychology. And this is because I was really um, astounded by the fact that disorders like, you know, schizophrenia or depression, anxiety, um, you can sort of create a, um, a different world, world in someone by you know, something, the machinery in, in their brain can create a world um, which is unfortunate and that people suffer from in cases of, you know, anxiety, depression and addiction and many other diseases. But there's also some amazing components in that our brain allows us to think, we can dream, we can, we can be creative, we can speak, communicate. And I was just amazed um, that all that was possible by the cells or neurons which are in our brain. So um, I was really um, interested in psychology in high school, but I decided to pivot for um, my undergrad. I went to undergrad at Washington University and there I studied uh, physics and I guess concentrated in astrophysics and uh, understanding like the birth of stars and how they uh, develop through their lifetime. And then um, after I finished undergrad, I went to graduate school for neuroscience, came back to neuroscience um, at Washington University in St. Louis. So just a quick bit on my un undergraduate research. So um, in my undergrad lab, it was, um, I guess, some biophysics, pharmacology, electrophysiology. But um, the goal of our lab was to understand the function of these voltage-gated potassium channels. So these potassium channels are essentially kind of like gates in a cell membrane that allow the passage of ions, as you can see here. So you, um, this is a potassium channel. Potassium builds up in a cell. And when these channels are opened um, and activated by something like voltage, you can get a current, which is just movement of ions out of the cell making the cell more negative here. And so in the lab, what we did a lot of, um, I guess, pharmacology, which means just seeing how, how do these um, uh, channels interact with different drugs, or um, as Juliet was saying, looking at the structure of these and maybe doing some manipulations to the structure to see what happens to the channel. Um, so yeah, we did that with the goal to one, understand how these uh, channels function normally in the body. And then also um, trying out different drug targets to see how they affect the properties of the channel. And then um, in my graduate research, uh, transitioning into neuroscience, um, I'm in a lab that studies, um, uh, tries to understand pain regulation so I'm sure pain is uh, pretty familiar to most of us. 
And um, it's pretty interesting phenomenon, I think. I think when you experience pain, you know, somewhere, maybe a headache or you burn your hand on the stove, the, these pain signals are sent through your spinal cord into the brain where the sensation of pain is created. So, um, okay. So yeah, um, uh, generally that kind of boils down to in the blue, you have this ascending pathway, which carries pain information to your brain. And there's a complementary but opposite pathway, the descending pathway, which can, you know, take those signals that you've received from the periphery of the point of your injury, and it can integrate things like emotion, stress, and memory into your experience of pain, all to change, you know, how you're feeling pain. So maybe if you're really stressed, um, this descending pathway may cause um, maybe a decrease in pain because there's something more immediately stressful that you need to worry about. Um, so yeah, these are response signals that are sent back from the brain to the body and change the experience of pain. So just to wrap up, in my lab, what we're doing now is using a lot of genetic tools to um, uncover some parts of descending modulations of pain such, um, so we use a lot of mice and microscopy methods to come up with um, images such as this one. So this is a region of, I'm studying in the brain. And what we've done here is like using tissue and genetic tools for mice, we can um, integrate fluorescent proteins that allow us to um, identify different types of cells. So all the different colors you see here are different types of cells. So um, yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. And um, yeah, that's, that's about me. That's, um, Great, thank you. What is that line in the middle? Uh, yeah, so this line, um, this region here is called the paraventric ventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus. And so it, in, in the mouse brain, it borders a third ventricle so this is just um, a site for, I guess, CSF um, flow throughout the brain and- Cerebral um, spinal fluid. Yeah, cerebral, just case, yeah. Just in case some of our attendees don't know. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, cerebral uh, spinal fluid, which is the, uh, I guess, kind of liquid um, in your brain that provides you know, nutrients and different things that your brain needs to um, keep keep going. So um, yeah, this is a third ventricle and these all these little tiny colorful dots are actually neurons that we're able to see by one, like using some genetic tools that can target some of the genes in these neurons and then attach a fluorescent protein to them. And now we can visualize them in these uh, pretty colors under a microscope. So, so does that suggest that there are certain genetic elements that modulate pain? So some people have different responses to pain or sensations to pain? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a really good question. And I think um, all throughout the, the pathway of pain, there's a lot of different points where, you know, um, you can have a different number of like receptors that may like make you more or less sensitive to, you know, a, 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 a painful stimuli. You may have um, a different cell population um, that underlies, or sorry, there are different cell populations that underlie specific types of pain. And there's different uh, sensory channels that can pick up like mechanical pain, heat um, from like when you burn on the stove or cold and all these different um, sensory modalities are seem to be regulated by different populations of neurons. So what we're doing in the brain here, and so the your brain expresses a lot of neurotransmitters, which are essentially chemicals that um, neurons use to communicate with each other. And depending on those chemicals, that 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 really shapes the nature of how it's communicating. Like if you have a certain com uh, 
neurotransmitter that may increase a signal, decrease a signal, uh, slowly uh, degrade or increase a signal over time. So yeah, there um, we we can see here that um, some of the markers we're looking at here um, may be specific sets of neurons that can contribute to pain. Great. I have uh, two more questions. Sure. Sure. One. How do you modulate pain? How do you measure it in the mouse? Yeah. Um, I guess, do they pull away or do they say ouch? Or, you mm -hmm. know, how do you actually, you know, measure that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And I guess one like critical point um, in animal studies is as you're saying, like with, with some animals, we can't communicate. We, we don't know exactly precisely what they're feeling. So in human studies, if you were to study pain, you would say um, maybe take a different um, set of like small pricks and you can ask the, the patient, you know, can you feel this? Can you feel this as you increase with like the magnitude? And they'll be able to say you, yeah, or kinda, not really. Um, but in mice, you know, the way we cannot communicate with mice. So a big cue we use is their, uh, their, their motion and feedback. So like maybe if we were to poke a mouse paw, the mouse might say like do a withdrawal, we call these withdrawal responses. And so that, that can look like a mouse moving its hand from the stimulus, it might start licking its paw or like shaking its hand kind of like this or um, several things. But um, so we, we never really know like truly if what's going on in the mouse's brain is equivalent to our experience of pain, but we can take cues from their behavior to kind of get a sense of what may be going on. Great, last question. So from astrophysics, how anything correlates with neuroscience? I mean, <laughs> you said birth of stars. I was immediately fascinated. <laughs> yeah. But, but how much of that actually helped in your current um, uh, uh, quest for, for understanding pathways and pain, modulation of pain. Yeah, yeah I think um, so that, that was a, that's an interesting question because I think, you know, coming into graduate school, I, I only took like, I think about two biology classes. So I didn't really know that much about biology at the point. But what I really liked about physics is kind of what I picked up on the way that you approach problems and, and solve problems. It's, it's a lot more math heavy and, um, you know, learning some, some coding, a lot of, I guess, mostly a lot of math and, um, you know, quantum and um, making sure you know your laws of physics to understand how those work together to, you know, form what we see as stars or how do the laws of physics change when you transition from a, you know, a star to a black hole. But um, so I guess directly, there's not that much um, overlap because, you know, of course, stars and brains are very different. But what I really appreciate is like being able to approach problems and solve them in, in kind of like the way that I learned in physics and apply that to the way that I think in neuroscience. And um, so that can lead to like some creativity sometimes and also um, the way that you do things and troubleshoot, like maybe you're working on something, but like as a physicist, and, uh, as I was training in physics, having some experience in like how electronics work and, you know, being able to troubleshoot some of the machinery we use and figure out what's going on there and um, really understand what's, you know, understand the components of the microscope so you can appropriately diagnose that um, when it goes on. So not a direct parallel, but I think definitely the skills that you learn in physics or any other field can be taken to another field and kind of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of like cross-disciplinary research because, you know, everyone comes from a different background and everyone has a um, special way of thinking. And, you know, if you bring that to a problem that everyone's working on, I think it'd be much easier to solve a lot of problems given these 
you know, the creativity of everyone in their individual backgrounds. Excellent, great, thank you for that. Cool. Um, any other questions before we move on to our next panelist? Just one uh, quick question. Um, thanks, Bobby, for your presentation. Do you have to use any particular type of mice? Um, like what, you know, I know that, you know, obviously the mice, uh, kind of mice you use is important to your research. So what kind do you use? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So we do have different, what they call strains or like uh, mice with, you know, specific sets of genes and phenotypes. Um, so in, in this experiments, we use, um, I guess what people would call the common mouse, um, ma common lab mouse, which we call C57. And um, in our lab, we were able to combine this with the um, Cree recombinase genetic technology. So what you can do is like, and some have got some of these pictures here, is we integrate um, Cree recombinase into a specific gene that we want to look at in the brain. And so once that's integrated, it makes it possible for us to, you know, really go in and target specific populations um, of neurons. But yeah, we're, we're using, I guess, the common mouse, uh, the C57 mine, um, along with the, the Cree genetic tools to do a lot of these experiments. Thanks. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks again, Bobby. And so now we'll move on to James Oseowusu. He's also a graduate student. I guess a lot of graduate students and they're happy, so that's great. <laughs> they're happy talking about their work. They, they put in long hours to study these, these fields or the, to answer these questions that they're presenting to you. Um, and so uh, turn it over to you, James. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here to share my story. Um, so my name is James. Um, I'm a PhD student um, in the cellular and molecular physiology program at Johns Hopkins. On the left here is an image of me um, doing what I do best or what I love to do best, that is research. And on the right is the beautiful campus, um, beautiful campus where I do my research. Now the question is, how did I get here? or how did I get to be in a research lab at Johns Hopkins? So this is how it all started. I was born in Ghana. I grew up in Ghana. Um, way before middle school, that is somewhere in a primary school, um, I was actually swept off my feet by a plant called mimosa. So on my way to school, um, we had a lot of these plants um, on the park. So um, we used to touch them. And the fascinating thing about this plant is that here you can see that it's normal, right? Um, but when you touch it, the leaves close up. And if you give it a hard touch, the stalk also um, falls a little bit, just like um, a protective mechanism. It's, it's like playing dead. And this was so fascinating. Like as a young boy, I found this so fascinating because all the other plants around me, they don't behave like that. Even I can get, uh, I can pluck mango, um, papaya, um, guava. I can take different fruits from different trees, but they don't behave like this. But this plant will just close up when you touch it. So I found this very fascinating, um, very intriguing. And I wanted to explore more about nature. So that um, actually led me to choose um, specific majors or specific courses in school. So um, during my high school, I focused on science. So I did um, science uh, electives. Then in college, um, I majored in biochemistry um, because I wanted to know more. Um, at some point, I was even fascinated by rainbow, why the skies are blue. Uh, I just wanted to know why things are the, the way they are. Um, so I followed that suit and, uh, did a biochemistry in college. And now um, following my passion, I ended up here in the US uh, at Johns Hopkins um, studying ion channels. 
So in Johns Hopkins, um, I'm in the Cho lab, and uh, this lab focuses on ion channels, just like um, Bobby explained what um, ion channels are. And uh, to me, um, ion channels are just the cell's gatekeepers, in the sense that these guys uh, or proteins uh, are in the membrane of um, the cell or the organelle, and they can allow things to come in or go out or go both ways. Um, depending on uh, or when activated, whether it's a ligand or voltage or whatever thing it is. So in my lab, we look at um, volume regulated anion channel, um, proton activated chloride channel, which I'll talk more about. And we are also really interested in discovering more ion channels. Interestingly, both um, so one and uh, the PAC, uh, we kind of identify the molecular identity of these channels. So to talk about the proton activated chloride channel, which we call PAC, I'm just showing uh, a structure of it, which we saw recently. And I really love looking at this um, uh, movie because it's so fascinating. It's, it's very beautiful how the, the, the molecules are moving. And they, not to describe too much uh, of the structure, but um, the moving part is the transmembrane domain. And actually this, it's interesting in the sense that you can look at your skin, right? But you don't see any proteins moving. You don't see the cells moving back and forth. But this is what is actually going on inside the cells, or this is what is going on if you're able to look beyond um, what our eyes can see. So upon protonation, this particular um, protein can move its um, transmembrane um, 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 domains. And uh, this, is, this is very beautiful. This channel was identified in the plasma membrane. Uh, recently, uh, we found that it's also in the endosomes. And just like uh, Bobby explained, uh, with the ion channels, we're able to record current, right? So um, since we found it to be in the endosomes, we wanted to know whether um, it's also functional in the endosomes, whether it's able to um, allow chloride to move um, outside of the endosome. To do the endosome is too small to um, do um, patch clamping on that. So to do that, we have to enlarge the endosomes. And when you're able to enlarge the endosomes, you can then pull the endosomes out and then record the channel activity. And this video is just to show um, how we're able to pull the endosome um, out of a cell. I really love this video because it's just uh, it's just nice to watch. So this is just somebody doing um, dissecting an, uh, a cell just to pull the endosome out. Then after that, you do your patch clamping, right? So I'm just going to show the dissecting and um, getting the endosomes out. So you break the cell memory, and these endosomes were enlarged by using a mutant trap file. So you pull. The endosome out gently. So the endosome is the is the one with the thin um, line over there. Yes, I I love watching this because it's so fascinating. Like um, to see endosomes being bigger, uh, more than their normal size, and, and pulling it out to be able to do um, patch clamping. So what have we found so far with um, the protein activated chloride channel? So we found that it's in the endosomes. We found out that um, from our recordings, it's um, when activated, it allows chloride to move outside of the endosomes. And uh, endosome pH is very, is tightly regulated. So if this um, regulation is, um, is messed up in a way, that can actually lead to a lot of different diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, even um, um, Alzheimer's, um, Alzheimer's um, for instance. And so um, this is a very important study. And uh, as much as we are looking at just one protein in the context of um, endosomes, we can actually target this protein um, to either um, regulate the uh, endosomal pH. In looking at a particular disease, we can um, target this protein to help regulate the endosomal pH. We also found that um, pathologically, this protein is uh, involved in ischemic stroke. So what happens is that um, during ischemic stroke, there's local acidosis, and that activates the channel, um, allowing chloride to move into the cell, and this can actually cause uh, neuronal uh, death. 
So um, then PAC becomes also a target for um, um, therapeutic treatment for ischemic stroke. So if we can um, target PAC um, in um, um, stroke patients, we might be able to reduce the number of cell death because um, our study shows that if you're able to delete PAC um, from the brain, um, the amount of cell death or the amount of damage done is um, reduced compared to um, um, having um, PAC present. Yes, yeah, so this is what uh, I've been up to. This is what um, just being fascinated by Mimosa has led me to, and I'm still fascinated by science. I still want to understand more, and I'll keep doing this. I love what I do, and I'll keep doing this. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, James. Any questions from the attendees? Um, I'll have I have a question. So, based on your your diagram here, um, mm -hmm. you have um, I guess chloride going in in one, and then chloride going out from the endosome. Yes. So is that is that um, by direct? I guess it's bidirectional, but. If we relate it back to the structure you showed, mm -hmm. um, why is it being chloride so small? Why would the transmembranes need to move like they do? Yeah, yeah, we we have no idea. And um, actually, um, the structure, um, looking at it in detail, um, shows that the um, the pore the pore radius is um, actually small to allow chloride to um, go through, but then. Um, the protein has fenestrations on the sides that can allow the chloride to um, do that movement. And uh, the structure that I showed is at um, pH 8 and pH 4 movement. Um, um, our study is showing that the pH 4 is likely to be um, a proton bound desensitized state. So it could have been um, gone through the activator state and in a desensitized state. So um, it would be wonderful to have um, an open structure, then we can really know the um, um, movements that go on um, having the open structure as well. Yeah. So what are those, what is the um, extracellular part? What are there any things that activate it on the extracellular or the side yes. that's outside of the cell? Yeah, so currently all we know um, of that can activate the channel is acid. Um, if you have a, a low pH that can activate the channel. Um, we are actually interested in finding um, other molecules or small molecules that can activate the channel because if we can find that, that would even um, kind of fasten um, our uh, work into um, finding an open structure because um, um, one of the challenges is um, the um, acidic state is kind of unstable. Um, I would say that is one reason. And also we have different structures um, using um, something like pH 5 or pH um, 4.6, yeah. Great, great, interesting. Now, could you just tell us what, the, what an endosome is? Oh, yes, an endosome. Um, so there are a lot of organelles in the, in the cell and uh, endosome is just one of them. Um, and uh, what it does is it, it has many functions. So it helps kind of bring things from the outside into the inside of the cell. So um, I would say that that is the main thing. And also um, it goes all the way into lysosomes. Um, so you have early endosomes, um, late end endosomes, you have recycling endosomes that bring things back onto the cell membrane. Then you also have the lysosomes and the lysosomes mainly for um, degradation. So if there's an unwanted protein or something that is no more um, functioning well, uh, the lysosomes can um, take it up and uh, eat it up, yeah. Great, so the cell's own delivery system. Yes. Right, so, okay, great. Any questions from attendees, um, panelists? Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing, James. That was pretty cool. Um, so when you were uh, sharing the structure of the protein and you had these like the, the rotating um, barrels at mm -hmm. the end, so you said that um, upon protonation, and I guess that's like a reception of a 
hydrogen um, mm -hmm. atoms. So mm -hmm. um, is that in the membrane and is that kind of twisting to allow chloride ions through or what's the, the twisting part doing, I guess? Yeah, so the, the twisting part I would say is just, um, the twisting part is just uh, the movement that we see when you move from a neutral state to an acidic state, right? And that is um, as a result of the protonation. So one of the things that we are interested in is finding out all the residues that are being protonated. So then if you can mutate those regions, can that stop the beautiful movement? Um, currently we have identified uh, a histidine residue um, that we think that when it's protonated, um, it breaks the interaction it has at pH 8 and it's fit into an acidic pocket. So that flipping uh, is part of the TM1, um, um, the transmembrane domain one movement that we see. And that is just like, uh, can, it, it's more like um, a chopstick or like uh, something like that, you know, like uh, using a chopstick. Okay. And um, I guess my last question, is it possible to do, um, or I, I guess wanted to say that looks, that was very awesome when you showed the video and mm -hmm. that looks very technically challenging. Um, so I, I was wondering is, are there like options for heterologous expression of this channel or does it have to be, you know, in an enzyme, in uh, endosome? Um, yeah, yeah, you can um, express it in uh, um, O cells, um, you can express it in um, hex cells, HeLa cells, you can express it in a lot of um, different cell types, yeah, and actually it's, uh, it's ubiquitously expressed in the, in, the, in the human, so you have it in a lot of um, cell types. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yes, thanks. So moving on to our next panelist, we have Dr. John Del Rosario, and he is a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and that's another level of training that uh, actually takes what you've learned in grad school and actually tries to challenge what you've learned in many ways. <laughs> and so he's p completed his PhD and now he's focusing on um, studying, uh, I guess as, as, as this, this um, panel is, is um, prominent in his ion channels. <laughs> yes. So go ahead. Dr. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, man. Um, yes. Yeah, so who am I? Thank you everybody for coming today. I think it's, it's a great opportunity that we get to share our science, our passion with so many people, specifically um, motivate others to continue following their path and their um, motivation in life. Do not ever give up. So who am I? So I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. So I'm Afro-Latino. Uh, my, my mother language is Spanish, but my, my second language is English. I came to the US when I was 17, right after finishing high school. And then I moved on to do my, I went to community college and then after community college, then I went um, to a senior college and I got my bachelor's in biology from City College of New York. And then I move on to do some more research in neuroscience. And I completed a master's in science as well in neuroscience in from City College of New York. After that, then I moved to New Jersey, which is just next door to New York. And I completed my PhD recently in biomedical sciences from Rutgers, from Rutgers University. Um, I'm, I'm naturally, I'm right now, um, currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Giro lab and studying ion channel nervous system remodeling after and before and after chronic pain. So what today I wanna to talk about is a little bit of stuff that I did during my PhD work. Um, and I just want um, to start off with the, um, the clinical relevance of what people do biophysics and what is extremely important to study uh, certain proteins that would regulate, regulate um, um, people's life, you know, so let me just start with this. So one second. So one of the things that I was studying in my lab is trying to understand um, somatosensory touch, 
which is basic very important for you. Your skin is a huge organ that depends on many different um, cues. And one of those cues is basically um, touch and sensation of many different um, cues like um, temperature and, and also um, a movement. So it is important for a key, for a little baby to experience a, a, um, a light touch from the mother. I think you start developing a bond. You start to understand how temperature feels. How, is this the strongest or is this to a small, the touch? Also, is a feather touch you, for example, you were able to detect it. So how the brain interpret those signals, you know, anything that comes to you. I, I'm always amazed sometimes myself about anything that happens in my surrounding that I'm able to detect it so fast. So I was very intriguing about how the nervous system is able to interpret signals so quick and integrate it in a way that we can acutely and sharply uh, sense those things really quick. So I don't know if anybody has experienced this, um, but also you get sunburn sometimes and even a feather touching you in the sun will definitely be painful. So understanding what are the proteins re important in regulation in, in, in sending that signal was extremely important. Another thing that um, that is important to understand is this the sense of proprioception, how sometimes you can stand up a, a, um, a do this kind of exercises and don't fall off um, a, or, or do some yoga, for example, how your body is aware of all your body parts. This is called proprioception. And these and these things like touching your nose without looking into, into your, without, with your eyes closed, all of these informations are integrated in the brain, but which are the molecules responsible for this? And I was studying this and I found that um, the, one of the molecules is PSO2. So, but, so it was recently discovered that this molecule, which is an ion channel, is was important for regulation of both proprioception and also um, a somatosensory touch. So what happened when you have too much of this? So while what you saw previously was something important that is an alarm system to actually be able to detect many different um, good, uh, a small, um, a, a, a different type of, of movement and also um, a senses and cues from the environment. But what will happen is you have too much of this protein. Like if you made a, a mutation, is that protein, if you are born with a protein that you have a mutation on it, or the mutation that that, cause, that, that this protein has will become or render this, this protein uh, inefficient. So this is what happens. So kids that actually are born with mutations in these channels, actually they you can see um, um, how they have musculoskeletal anormalities, and this also happens. They develop a, a scoliosis, um, and, and as you can see, how their feet and their hands they develop this extremely advanced arthritis problem. So this protein is extremely important for the regulation of light touch, proprioception, and also um, muscle, mus muscle skeletal uh, uh, development as well. So this is what I was interested in studying in grad school, is trying to understand how this protein function and what specifically molecules can regulate the activity. So this protein, is how it looks basically this the structure of this person was released and as you can see is it, it has many different we call it curls but it's definitely many helices that's what it's called and this is how the protein falls and what i did in my grad study was to take this protein and insert it into into cells i was transfecting this into a cell in this protein, one particular thing that it has is that it's a mechanically activated. So you definitely and literally need to pop the cell in order for you to be able to get ion channels to come through this through this protein, as you can see here. So when you pop the cell, this protein is going to open, and the opening of this protein will allow ions to come through. So this is what I study, and this is how the the currents look like. As you can see, the the stronger is the stimulus, the bigger is the problem. The bigger is will be the current that coming into the cell, and we can measure this electrophysiologically using um um using um electrophysiological tools in the lab, um in trying to understand this. So one thing that I was trying to understand is that 
This is what happens when this when the protein is normal. What will happen is the protein is altered by any other by any other accessory protein in the in, in the cell. So as you can see, I took this protein and I use a molecule called baclofen. Baclofen is an activator of another protein that seems to be regulating many ion channels. This is called GI protein couple receptors. And also baclofen is used as a relief of back pain because it's also a, a, a drug that is approved to relieve back pain. So I tried to understand what would happen is this, is this drug is um, could be a Will be added to the to the cells, and what would happen to the to piezo proteins? So what I found out is that, as you can see here, it's very clear that is you add baclofen to the cells, uh, and you also include the protein that baclofen activates. You can see that this protein is exact; these currents are exacerbated. It means it's enhanced, it's increased. So suggesting that the protein that baclofen activates modulate the activity of PSO channels, PSO2 channels. And just to make it a story short, I was able to find that not only baclofen was activating one protein, but it was or orchestrating many different signaling mechanisms to regulate the activity of these currents. As you can see here, the channel and definitely affect this current. So definitely, as you can see, we can take a problem from, from, from the human that actually doesn't seem very, very trivial to study. And just one single molecule or one single protein could definitely modulate the, the, the activity of, of, of so a human being to move, to, um, to walk, to, uh, to, um, to touch, so there are so many different things that could be affected by just um, a, um, affecting this protein as well. So this is what actually I did during my, this is part of what I did in my PhD work. And, and it's cool to work with ion channels because in our body, we depend on ion channels for so many different things. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Thank you, Dr. Del Rosario. Any questions from the attendees or panelists? So can you explain the connection between the GABA receptors and the piezo 2 Okay, so really cool is, this is a great question. Um, and and the, the most important thing about the GABA receptors in, in the connection with piezo channels is that Ga with actual GABA receptors are GI copper receptors. So they, 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 there are many different types of G protein copper receptor and GABA receptors are specifically GI. So one thing that we don't know is that people that actually, so it has been shown that activation of GI copper receptor can modulate mechanosensitivity. And this could also lead to uh, painful stimuli. So since, since PSO2, is a mechanosensor that it regulates the activity of light touch, mechanosensitivity. We wanted to know if activation of GABA receptor could modulate the activity and make the connection that it could potentially be a, modula a modulator of mechanosensitivity. I didn't show this because I didn't have time, but if you inject GABA B, you can enhance mechanosensitivity. And we believe that it's because PSO2 channels are altered. The activity of these channels are altered and that could also enhance mechanosensitivity and could potentially be a mechanism for mechanical touch. And also mechanical touch that will lead to painful stimuli. Thank you, thank you for that. Any other questions, comments for Dr. Del Rosario? I have one quick question. Um, thanks for your presentation, John. You mentioned that you have to poke the cells to activate the protein. I was just wondering, how do you do that? Do you do that with uh, <laughs> with an agent or do you- So I have, so normally in the lab, we have a mechanical glass probe that is fire polish, right? And then what you do is, you go into the cell 
with a we have other equipment in the lab that will deliver a specific stimulus at a specific rate. And that would definitely elicit a response into the cell when PSO2 channels are transfected into those cells. So you deliver a, a continuous or increasing step stimulus that will deliver a specific response to the cell. And that's how you actually are able to, to study the channel response. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was gonna, I did have that question. I forgot about that. <laughs> Yes. So why would you poke a cell? But uh, definitely, well, we this do, is amazing. We and I, to we, understand. And that's, this is the, not the only one. There are many different ion channels who depends on mechanical changes at the membrane. And this is part of biophysics. You know how the mechanics of the plasma membrane actually regulates the activity of ion channels. So we have so many different things. Physics is is the membrane is 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 swollen. Would it, would, it be, would it affect the activity? Of course it does. So these things are important. When you when you become hypotonic or hypertonic, would it be different affect this? So yeah. Excellent, thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns? If not, then we'll move on to our last panelist for this session, Dr. Tavi Hawkins. Uh, who is a professor at, um, I, and now I'm blanking on it, um, University of Maryland? No, I'm at a, Sorry. I'm actually, I just moved and I'm at St. Kate's right now. And so okay. I am Sorry. no longer in the classroom, but a division okay. chair of oh, math nice. and sciences. Oh, wow. So we went straight from postdoc all the way to the top of division chair. <laughs> but, um, but thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you guys see it? All right then. So yes, as of January, I relocated uh, just up the river a little north to St. Paul's. And so I'm at St. Catharines and I am the division chair. So I have math, biology, physics, and chemistry in my wheelhouse, as well as computer science. And so this is lovely St. Kate's now, and it actually does look like that now that everything is thought out. So prior to this, I was actually a professor of physics uh, I want to go. Okay. I was a professor of physics and chair of the physics department at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And so it's it's really interesting because my journey of physics in physics has been a lifetime of being the only one or the first one. Yes. And so it's been uh, very isolating, uh, but rewarding all at the same time. And you really have to go where your passions are. Um, as you can see, there's little me and my oldest brother sitting over here in the black and white picture. Uh, so that's how old I am before they actually had colored pictures. Uh, here I am when I finished up my PhD work at the University, uh, Syracuse University in upstate New York. Here I am at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Here I am teaching physics class, talking all about forces, using the force tables there. Here I am with my research group. I work with only undergraduates. Uh, here I am back just as I was on the path going to, um, I cannot believe that. Um, I always get that phone call about your auto insurance expired. So I'm sorry about that. Here I am doing my last uh, set of experiments at Lawrence University. And then here I am uh, talking to a group of middle school students talking about science and uh, this uh, person here, uh, Dr. Harris had actually written a book talking about her grandmother who was one of the women at NASA. So I was the closest thing that they could get to an astronaut in little bitty lacrosse and I enjoyed it immensely. And so my path in uh, physics, to physics, to becoming a PhD was, uh, I started off at inner city Chicago. I'm a product of public schools. Uh, I always knew I was interested in math and science. Here I am, I have two brothers, 
one older, one younger. I'm right in the middle. Here's my mom and dad. My, mom, my dad is a mechanical engineer. My mother is an accountant. So everything was a pop quiz, adding up, going to the grocery store, whatever, everything. I remember learning algebra. Uh, my, mm, I think we started in like fifth grade when the Chicago public schools went on strike. My father was like, oh, you won't be playing all day. Here's some worksheets for you to work on. So you know how that goes. Here is an actual photocopy of uh, the book that actually got me interested in science, uh, Comet. Uh, it was at the Chicago Public Library. I took the book. I still have the book. And yes, I paid the library fine for the book. So I own it now. So I did all of the normal things that uh, one would do uh, growing up. S math and science was just always there in the background. I was a cheerleader in high school. I was a pom-pom in junior high. I joined the rocket club. Uh, I played clarinet. I went to a math and science high school. I actually worked at McDonald's during high school. So I did all of those things. But one interesting thing about the neighborhood I came from is the same neighborhood Michelle Obama grew up in, Inglewood in Chicago. Same neighborhood um, Thompson, uh, tennis champion Thompson came from. And so lots of great things came out of that area. So it's exciting to grow up there. So along the way, I did, uh, did my undergrad work at the University of Iowa. Um, I left physics for three years to become a real estate asset manager in New York City. And I liquidated the Resolution Trust Corporation's asset portfolio in the New York, New Jersey uh, metropolitan area. But then I just, I really missed physics. I really missed problem solving, uh, thinking about something that you couldn't get over. Um, I, I just missed everything about it. So I went back to physics after three years and I went to graduate school, like I said, at Syracuse University. When I left Syracuse, um, I went to uh, Mount Holyoke where I was teaching uh, basically just uh, as a visiting instructor. And then I, right down the street was University of Massachusetts. And there I found somebody that I wanted to do research with. So my graduate work was in nonlinear systems. And so I looked at uh, cell signaling, which is a nonlinear system, and also building human computer interfaces for people uh, like quadriplegic people to give them an alternative way to be able to interface to a computer, to do uh, send a signal, but basically gesture recognition uh, was my uh, dissertation work. And so along the way, I did a master's in computer science. And so now I got all of these skills and I'm really, really passionate about teaching. And so I knew I wanted to work on a project that would be accessible to physics students and work on something in my uh, postdoc that I could take with me onto my next job. And so when you see my lab, it looks just like a, a wet lab in a biology department. And I do microscopy. So I look at uh, microtubules and you see right here is a picture of me in the lab uh, looking at fluorescently labeled microtubules. And so microtubules, those guys are the largest filaments inside of the cell. So those are those little fingers when the cell is pulled apart so that you can see sort of here in this light green color. These are microtubules here. There's your nucleus of the cell. And so when the cell wants to crawl. So I'm really interested in microtubules from a structural perspective. Somehow microtubules get tuned when they need to pull apart. They need to be really flexible. But when they need to add support and structure to the cell, they have a different rigidity. And so that's actually what my lab measures. How rigid is your filament? And so the technique that I use is the same technique that an engineer would use in trying to determine structural integrity for a building or a, um, a bridge, whatever type of structure you're looking at. And so these guys, I like to think of them as little beams 
And so here you see microtubules uh, growing and shrinking. And so they're very dynamic. But when I look at them, I stabilize my microtubules so that they're just one length. And now in the same way that you would study like how rigid or how bendy is a spring, right? You'd apply a force to it. That's in essence what I'm doing with my microtubules. So right here, you see, I have one single microtubule isolated. And so I'm looking at it all by itself and a cover slip, and it's got a little bit of uh, fluid in there, essentially water. And so at that level, in the same way with, you know, a bigger spring, you would apply a force, see how much it was displaced when you applied this force. And then from there, you could extract what's known as the spring constant. And so in essence, that's what I'm doing here and trying to determine how rigid is my microtubule. We call that the persistence length how far along the uh, body of that filament could I travel before the force essentially makes that, um, that filament no longer straight. And so at this level, what I'm looking at are thermal forces. And so we as physicists know a lot about uh, forces. And so I'm just applying it to something on the micron level. So as you see that microtubules dancing around there, I take that image of a microtubule, I make it into one pixel thick, and then I take that shape of the actual microtubule and I fit it to the normal mode, so the first 25. And from that, essentially I do a little bit of math, which I was like, I'm not even gonna put down on here, but I do a little bit of math and the inverse of the variance in that actual shape of the microtubule and essentially the first normal mode the difference in the two is one over that difference gives you the persistence length. So that's a measure of how rigid a filament is. It's the same technique you use in a beam, in a building. It's the same technique you use if you wanted to know what kind of conditioner I'm using on my hair. and I want it to be a certain softness. And so essentially, um, I won't go into the details of all of the sophisticated, well, it's not really sophisticated. I would say up to calculus level math that I would use. Um, essentially, I get, um, I get a, a, a distribution of the persistence length. I look at multiple images from one batch of microtubules and I take movies of them. And then I do this for something like 25 of those. And this is a distribution of what it would look like if I did a log normal plot. Essentially, um, in trying to tease out what's going on with you know, a batch of microtubules, you would need to keep doing a lot of experiments. But instead of doing that, you could just put some statistics on top, which would give you a much easier way in order to be able to predict what that distribution is doing. And so it's really nice, uh, this type of work, because I've worked with anybody from high school students all the way up through postdocs uh, and using this method. And it's something that's accessible to the types of students that I train. So that's what I do in terms of my research. And I really like to impress upon you guys, right? I've had many different loves, things that I was very passionate about throughout my life. And really at this level, you guys are on the precipice of just being able to write your own story. Don't feel that you have to take the path to your discipline or where you'll end up in the end in the way that traditional people do their paths. We've all come to biophysics from many different avenues and all are one big happy family. And because I'm a classically trained physicist who works on biological problems, I always get the opportunity to, to work really uh, closely with biologists or people from chemistry or computer science. And I really have enjoyed that along the path. And so, you know, write your own story. But this is one thing I wanna leave you guys with as you think about your next step. 
America's story has always been written by people who can see what can be. That's where you guys are. Unburdened by what has been. So write your own story and come on and let's do some biophysics. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Tavi. Uh, any questions for Hawkins? I have some questions too. Um, Dr. Hawkins, um, mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask you, um, with the rigidity of the uh, microtubules change depending on the substrate in which you put them, um, um, in, in, in EC does, I was just thinking very, I, I very abstractly and just came out, out, out of my mind, but do you believe that microtubule change in, let's see, in cancer cells who actually evades different um, mechanisms to travel to different places um, as this as the cell architecture depends on them what do you, um, you would you offer some insight and do you believe that it might also affect this is just two questions in one but it's... okay so yes the rigidity does change based on the viscosity of whatever substrate you're looking at it at and so what I actually do is looking at microtubules in vitro so microtubules by themselves. And then I would add some additional either uh, proteins or other filaments in there to see how it's being tuned. So ultimately, and this is a lifetime of research even ahead of me. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to passing that torch to the next generation to do those next assays. But we really need to understand, well, how rigid is that one filament? How is it affected when you have other microtubule associated proteins in the near vicinity, which we know tune that rigidity? And then how does that change when you have two, three, when you have actin, when you have, you know, any other number of proteins or even drugs in the vicinity? You know, how does how is that affected? One thing that I do know um, is that. These studies were done first, like over 30 years ago, and we're still busy characterizing how rigid is your microtubule. And it's important in terms of if you're going to uh, start to develop therapies or like drugs, right? Like Taxol is a really important one. Until we came along, people estimated like how rigid a microtubule had to be or was with taxol there. And so we came along and we said, mm, it's on the order of about a millimeter, which is a strange thing in itself, since you're looking at something on a micron, 10 to the minus six level, right? And I'm saying something that's 10 to the minus three is how long you can travel before it bends. Did I get all your questions in? Yes, thank you so much. I was just saying that um, I think that understanding microtubules could definitely be offered insights into um, diseases like cancer that depends on movement of different cells from one place to another. And no, I don't think people have studied whether these microtubule or microtubule associated proteins change the rigidity for the cells to evade from one place to another. And that could also offer opportunities for many people to to find ways because there is no one single drug that is universal uh, for cancer and cancer has been a devastating disease and when it metastasized definitely affect many different things so that's mm -hmm. basically what i would say yeah dr taviari that uh tavier hawkins that was a wonderful talk and i've learned so much I guess to conclude this session, uh, I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give to students that are interested in exploring research in STEM fields? So what should be their first step if they're like really excited about what they've seen today and they really are eager to learn more about how to become scientists? Is that for me first? I yes. think uh, <laughs> the, the thing, if you're really interested in science, get involved. I started off in Upward Bound. So just really, I take students at the high school level in my lab and 
they go off and do incredible work, not necessarily still working with microtubules, right? It's just your toy system that you start off with, uh, but you could, some students do continue to work with microtubules. But if you're interested, stop by your local university and find out what summer science programs they have available to you, even at the high school level. Sometimes it's a Saturday morning thing. Get involved. Yeah, that's a great point. I like to add, I started teaching with Upper Bound. So yes, <laughs> I love Upper Bound. Um, and you know, what we've realized in this uh, pandemic is that everyone's accessible a little more so than we would like. Um, and so the same way you found physics, um, you can think about what area interests you and contact people through social media and say, hey, I, I, I you know, heard about you from biophysics or I looked at your website, your social media site, and I'm interested because I, I hope to one day become a scientist or understand um, ion channels um, and just really make that connection. As you, as you probably can see from this, uh, scientists really love to talk about what they do. <laughs> um, and so um, people will welcome the opportunity to talk about their work and potential ways to connect you with people with 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 their research or other people doing research that that interests you. So definitely take the time to um, explore. I mean, that's exactly what research is. Figure out what's out there. I, I, I'm still fascinated by all the panelists. So thank you everyone for um, explaining uh, your work and actually how you what led you to uh, uh, for us to meet here in biophysics. Basically, um, we're, we're we're a growing community and um, and we welcome everyone and and look forward to kind of connecting with some of the attendees, um, hopefully in real life, definitely in social uh, and virtual space, but also in real life. Any other questions, last minute questions from the attendees, pressing questions, um, best trajectories. If anyone can, can offer, um, uh, some of you did masters, how did that help? Was it required? Um, but just think about even, you know, for, if we have high school students on here, um, what to major in, you know, you know, that's, you know, I did engineering in my senior year, realized I didn't want to be an engineer. <laughs> yes. So if anyone wants to chime in and I answer that. I can jump in. So when I used, I came right after high school from Dominican Republic and I remember that I was doing my, my okay, I, I was doing my, um, my bachelor's in science, in bio, but I started as a biomedical engineering student. And then I realized that I was really into um, understanding a little bit more of the creativity that you can actually do in biology. And I was getting excellent grades as well in biology. And I was like, this is what I wanted to do. Then I, I received an opportunity to do an internship in the Netherlands for three months as a molecular neuroscientist. And then I went there and I realized that I needed to do my master because it was going to help me to choose is I really wanted to do a PhD. A PhD is a big commitment and you definitely need to be sure that you want to spend six to five to six, seven years of your life studying a mechanism and all the ups and downs that comes with it um, and trying to understand that this is what I really want to do. Um, and I decided and it, was, it, it went really well. And I want to tell you also, um, th there are so many opportunities. There are so many um programs that will support you through grad school. So do not think that just because you don't have the economical means, that's gonna be a barrier for you to achieve your dreams. There's still a lot of stuff for you to achieve. So I believe that um, you should move forward. But I think um, just follow your passion, whatever makes you feel happy. Do never think or do never let anyone to, let to, um, to dictate your future. You are the one who actually have everything in your hands to achieve whatever you want to achieve. And you can write your own path. Do not allow anybody to tell you, you cannot do this because of this and this and this. You have the power and you choose what to be and who to be in the future. 
Thank you, Dr. Del Rosario. Anyone else last minute comments? Or? Add on to what John said and that for you to have an open mind because I also like didn't know I I don't I didn't like major in a particular like science field like biology or physics or chemistry. Um like I mentioned before, I have a pharmacy background. So most of what I learned was just mainly how to understand how drugs work. I had to memorize a thousand and one drugs in my head and I worked as a pharmacist, but I had an open mind and I realized that's not what I wanted to do. I did not, I wouldn't say I don't like people much, but I just, I prefer to be, you know, in the back scenes of research. So that's why I decided to do this. And even for my master's. So the reason why I did my master's was just so I get that experience to be competitive enough to do a PhD. So that's why I got my master's and I didn't have a lot of research experience leaving pharmacy, the pharmacy career to a PhD. And also I didn't even know I was gonna do something in biophysics. So I had a very open mind. And, um, you know, also when you get there, um, you know, you have the opportunity to do a lot of rotations. That's something that we do in, uh, in the PhD program. You can rotate with different uh, professors and the professor that you might think you want to work with, you might not even end up working with that person. So it's just, you have to really have an open mind. And like John said, just don't think you can do it just because you, you feel like you don't have the um, expertise or you don't have the experience. Yeah, I guess uh, just picking, piggybacking off of that. And um, I, I agree, definitely keep, in, keep an open mind. And um, as you like go through um, undergrad college, remember it's okay to change your mind. Um, and you, you don't have to be stuck in one area. You, you should be, you should feel free to explore. Um, I, I didn't do a master's, but I uh, took a gap year for research. And that can be another way to get, you know, some more research experience and a good time, you know, you'll be doing full-time research pretty much. And it's a good time to consider, is this something I really enjoy? And Want to want to spend a few more years um, doing so? Yeah, I I, I say um, explore as much as you can. Um, and it was really cool to see the panel here. Everyone coming from different areas, but just seeing that you know, no matter what background you're from, you can you know come together with others to solve um, similar problems. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Dr. Hawkins, can I ask a question from your talk, actually? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was really cool when you were showing the, um, the, the microtubules and you can apply a force and look at, you know, how many nodes form and um, I was, that reminded me of like, you know, in, in sound or, you know, you take like a string based on the, the force and frequency applied, you can, you know, yep, learn. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking like, um, I don't know too much about this, but I've heard of a optical trap technique, I think, which allows you to kind of like maybe fix the ends. Um, and I guess, I wanted to ask from then, uh, like what what's the nature of the force you're applying? You said it was thermal or? Mm -hmm. okay. So essentially right inside of the slide cover slip uh, chamber, right, there's water. And so as you saw, the microtubule was like dancing, right? It's doing this little, and so that's due to the molecules, the water molecules interacting with the microtubule and that's what's making it undulate. And so essentially just taking that shape, right? Since we know that those are on a level of thermal forces. So we know what the uh, persistence length calculation will look like because essentially you're just taking that shape. You break that filament of into smaller steps and then you fit it to the shape of those normal modes. And so I take that image and I do it to each one of those 25. 
And so the variance in that really is one over that gives me the persistence length. Okay. But with the force probe one, they know how much they're pushing on it. So they know what that applied force is. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Whereas mine is on the level of KBT. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay. I was just curious, like, since that reminded me so much of like the, the strings and frequencies, is it possible to apply like um, sound maybe and look at maybe like resonance frequency? I don't know, like maybe it's very too small scale for that, but. Well, I mean, in the same way that, you know, like you do the sound on a string and you watch it undulate, right? But at the end, ultimately, we know that typically there's a force with that spring machine or a string machine that creates waves. But if any, any kind of force that you could measure, you could do this experiment with. I mean, think about spaghetti in a pot with boiling water, right? It's the same thing. All I'm doing is taking a movie of that microtubule wiggling around. And because I know on the order of magnitude what those forces are, I can measure a persistence length. Okay, got it. In the it. same way you do it with a spring, right? You pull it, see how much it displaces, get what K is. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you never know what settings you learn you talk, you get ideas. So this is this is this was great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you to our attendees. And uh, we'll still entertain any other questions. I guess we still have a few minutes. But if not, then we can just chat or